I'm going to get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third annual Queer Direction Symposium Transformations. I'm so happy to see all of you here. Um, it's really a thrill. <laughs> Um, the sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was a subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Turo Wampum says, we are going to live on this land together and respect each other's sovereignty. The Dish with One Spoon is an agreement that recognizes that we live off of the same resources. It's hard to eat a collective meal together off of a dish with one spoon. Hence, protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and the land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 calls to action reaffirms that the treaties with indigenous peoples must be lawfully honored. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding those agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. Um, I also have a lot of other people that I'd like to thank. Um, first, starting with Martha McCain and the Global Initiatives Fund that allows us to host the Queer Directions every year. I want to thank my amazing team at the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies, Dai Kojima, Valley Wedek, and Victoria Lau. It is such a pleasure to work with such brilliant and amazing people. I owe a lot of gratitude to the committee that helped me put this whole thing together, Robert Diaz, T.L. Cowan, Jasmine Ralt, Patrick Kilty, and V.K. Preston. Finally, I want to thank our five guests for being with us t today. It's such a thrill to have them all. I cannot wait for the symposium to actually begin when I stop talking. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to introduce our moderator for the day, Professor Trish uh, Salah. Uh, professor Salah is Associate Professor in Gender Studies at Queen's University. Her work focuses on transnational studies in gender, sexuality, race, and minority cultural production. Her Shirk-funded research project towards a trans minor literature examines the aesthetic and political projects of trans, transsexual, genderqueer, and two-spirit writers. She was co-organizer of the writing trans genres, emergent literatures and criticism, and decolonizing and decriminalizing trans genres conferences, and is the author of two books of poetry, Lyric Sexu Sexology, Volume 1, and Wanting in Arabic, for which she won a Lambda Literary Award. Uh, she was a finalist for the 2018 Ogilvy Prize for LGBTQ Emerging Writers and recently co-edited a special issue of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, on trans cultural production. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Salah. This is a room. <laughs> nice to see you all. Um, please come in, find seats, make yourself comfortable. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here in such good company and with such vital political thinkers, writers, activists, all of the above, all at once. Um, it's lovely to be your guest, Dana, and the guest of this program, this symposium. Uh, thank you, Valley, in particular, for work arranging my participation. Um, and thank you, everyone, who worked to make the symposium happen, uh, and everyone for coming out. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our speakers in just a moment, um, and uh, they'll each speak for about 18 minutes, and then uh, we'll have some question and discussion and a larger conversation. Um, but uh, for now, I just want to take a moment to notice that the first 
trans-related event, one of the first trans-related events I recall here on the U of T campus was a 1998 performance by Ayanna Maracle, who keynoted the Counting Transgenre Conference. Counting Transgenres? Counting past two. I have hybridized myself in Mira Soleil Ross. God forgive me. Mira, forgive me. <laughs> Uh, the uh, Counting Past Two Festival, a trans arts conference uh, organized by Mira Soleil Ross, a uh, performance artist, activist extraordinaire, uh, her boyfriend Mark, who has since passed, uh, her best friend Xanthra Philippa McKay, who has since passed, um, and Xanthra herself, a writer, a filmmaker, a publisher of the legendary zine Gender Trash, which many of you have had an occasion to look at through Laura Horax. Uh, curated exhibit. Um, and Mira had a lot of other help as well. Mira herself has relocated away from Toronto. Ayanna Maracle herself has passed. For those of you who don't know Ayanna Maracle's name, Sovereign Haudenosaunee, woman transformed woman uh, who loves women, uh, a uh, nationally recognized artist whose memory is less well held than it should be in this moment. Uh, so I, I hark back to the late 90s and the early 90s to say that uh, Toronto to Toronto was and is a vital place of transsexual, transgender, cultural production, um, that uh, it is interesting to be four years past the tipping point or something, and to remember 25 years ago, people older than me have better and longer memories. Um, and I just want to name a few other names of people who are still with us and some people who are not, who have helped make a, this a space where we could collectively be. I see Alec Butler in the room. I see Bear and Jay in the room. I see, um, not in this room, Rupert Raj. I see, um, uh, Kyle, who is no longer with us. I see Rosalind Forrester and Monica Forrester, both of whom have done extraordinary work in activist communities in the city. Um, so I just, wanna, I just want to think about this as part of a longer duration of cultural production here. And uh, I also want to name Samaya Del Mar, who passed more recently as well, a dear friend and, and talented artist, model, um, and activist who performed uh, through her portraiture um, uh, a public discourse on what it is to, Soma to be Somali, what it is to be Muslim, what it is to be trans, and to be more than each of those things. Um, so I'm going to name our guests and uh, introduce them in order, then they will each speak, and then we will go to Q&A. Um, Aaron Nizura is Assistant Professor in Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies at the University of Minnesota, where he specializes in queer theory, transgender studies, transnationality and immigration, political economy and labor. Azura's research looks at how queer and transgender bodies shape and are shaped by technologies of race, gender, transnationality, medicalization and political economy. His book, Mobile Subjects, Travel, Transnationality and Transgender Lives, Duke University Press 2018, examines how understandings of race, gender, and aesthetics shape global cosmetic surgery cultures and how economic and racially stratified marketing and care work create the ideal transgender subject as an implicitly white global citizen. In so doing, he shows how understandings of travel and mobility depend upon the historical architectures of colonialism and contemporary patterns of global consumption and labor. Morgan M. Page is a writer and artist in London, England. She is the creator and host of One from the Vaults, the first and only trans history pro podcast, the founder of Twat Fest, Trans Women's Arts Toronto, and author of numerous articles and chapters on trans culture, including Brazen, the Trans Women's Safer Sex Guide. Her video work includes Love Positive Women, Last Words at the Fall of the Transsexual Empire, and Treat You Like a Lady. Her video art has shown in galleries and festivals around the world, and her essays have been published in Dazed, BuzzFeed, The Globe and Mail, Guts Magazine, CBC Arts, as well as in anthologies including Best Sex Writing of the Year, Volume 1, and Red Light Labor. 
Her fiction has been published in literary magazines such as Plenitude, as well as anthologies such as Meanwhile Elsewhere, Science Fiction and Fantasy from Transgender Writers. One from the Vaults has been running since January 2016 and seeks to make trans histories accessible beyond the archive and the academy. As Paige puts it, One from the Vaults brings you all the dirt, gossip, and glamour from trans history. C. Riley Snorton is professor of English, language, and literature at the University of Chicago. He specializes in queer and transgender history and theory, critical race studies, performance studies, and popular cult culture studies. He is the author of Nobody is Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low, and Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity, winner of the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Nonfiction, the American Library Stonewall Honor Book in nonfiction, the American History Association Bo John Boswell Prize, and the Modern Language Association William Sanders Scarborough Prize. The book draws together an archive ranging from early sexological studies to fugitive state slave narratives and 20th century journalist accounts of black trans people to make a compelling case for the ways that blackness and transness co-constituted one another in their historical constitution. Snorton has been a recipient of the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship of the New York Public Libraries, Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, and Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship at Pomona College, and two fellowships at Harvard's W. E. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research. Finally, Alok Ved Menon is a gender performing, gender non conforming, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a Baroness von Sketch about that. Uh, a gender non-conforming performance artist, writer, educator, and activist. They use their poetry performance in eclectic fashion to challenge the gender binary and celebrate gender non-conformity. In 2015, with Janani Balusabramian, they created Dark Matter, a spoken word performance duo. They have performed and been invited to speak around the world. In their 2017 poetry chapbook, Femme in Public, on social media, and in numerous online articles and interviews, they embrace radical vulnerability and celebrate a complex vision of trans femininity that disobeys conventional notions of gender performance and embodiment. So please welcome our guests. Just give me a second to get plugged in. I also noticed that there's a couple of chairs that are vacant. So like there's one there, and then there's one up there, and then there's one down here, and one here. So if you want to, people who are standing up, you're going to be standing up for a long time. <laughs> Come sit. Yeah, or sit. I don't know. Be comfortable. Thank you uh, to Dana for inviting me, and thanks a lot to Valley for making all the logistics possible, travel um, and accommodation. And also, uh, thanks to everybody for coming. But uh, I'm just really honored to be in this company. It feels um, pretty special, and this feels like a special room to, to be in conversation with. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to launch right in. In the 2015 film Tangerine, two trans girl BFFs are walking endlessly through the neglected urban landscapes of West Hollywood. The film's major plot arc involves Cindy, who just got out of a month of jail time and is looking for the white, non-trans woman her lover Chester has been cheating on her with. Cindy's best friend, Alexandra, accompanies her on a shifting quest to get revenge, or maybe an account of what happened or maybe simply affect and intimacy to occupy her time. We never see where Alexander and Cindy live throughout the film. Their lives may as well be conducted entirely on the street. And because neither one has a car, they walk everywhere. Walking means, among other things, hanging out, conducting social and financial transactions, exchanging drugs, services, and sometimes having or getting gossip, support, or intimacy. Alexander and Sydney are wageless, um, or formerly wageless. They make money by doing sex work and possibly other informal transactions. 
a stable wage is out of reach and possibly undesirable for them, and so are the structures of debt and formal financial accounting practices that characterize inclusion within contemporary capitalism. For the trans girls and tangerine, inhabiting public space is also precarious. Their whole world involves walking while trans, um, a term that's become popular to describe how trans women of color and black trans women in particular are routinely criminalized for daring to make visible their departure from racial and gendered normativity, a departure that's universally understood as both threatening and signaling something sexual. So this paper swerves towards and around a reading of Tangerine to think through some of the conceptual apparatuses that we're using at the moment, and in particular the left is using, uh, to understand intersectional social vulnerability right now in relationship to transness. I raise questions about how trans people of color and black trans people have been claimed as the most vulnerable subjects in social justice contexts to move towards thinking towards gender nonconforming personhood along critical conversations about race, labor, movement, autonomy, and capacity. So the term walking while trans, whoops, I'm just gonna go back to the walking while trans slide. The term walking while trans points to policing as an instrument for criminalizing informal economies, homelessness, and gender non-normativity, right, in order to distribute life chances unequally. And that policing and social service provision, provision works to reproduce the line between what are understood as vulnerable or at-risk populations and those who are considered capable, uh, con capable of taking risks, those who can aspire to an investor model of subjectivity in which they're trusted to enact the rational behaviors of entrepreneurial self-management. And we should add that the logics by which different subjects um, are defined by risk and entrepreneurialism are intensely racialized, right? One risk is good, one risk is understood as bad. In recent queer and trans scholarship that engages the state violence against trans and gender nonconforming people of color, numerous terms have emerged to describe the situation. Necropolitics, bare life, precarious life, surplus life, and so on. And to write of queer or trans necropolitics marks a moment in which intersectional analyses reveal how the state's institutions appear to eagerly consign queer and trans populations of color to disposability or death. Um, as uh, Jin Haridawan, who's also a Toronto person, I'd like to cite here or name here, um, and Riley um, wrote in Transsexual Necropolitics. However, transgender as a category of personhood has also become administratively visible within um, national and international human rights regimes as something that renders subjects particularly vulnerable and that also requires governmental and bureaucratic literacy. Just as the cultural shift towards trans visibility is rife with contradictions, so is this administrative shift. And much of this thinking has come out of HIV activism, queer and trans prison abolition work, and projects dedicated to serving those who are most targeted uh, by institutional and extrajudicial violence, right? Um, so a lot of this work actually centers leadership. I don't know why my slides keep on blinking, but I'll try to, I don't know. Hopefully they won't blink while I'm showing you the clip later. Um, oh, it's not? It's just that. Sorry, the like screen in front of me is blinking. I'm like, <laughs> it must be blinking for everybody. Um, so a lot of this work centers uh, prison abolition work, right? Um, and also centers leadership by black trans women and trans women of color. Um, so I'm thinking of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, um, TGJIP in the Bay Area, to name a, just a couple of examples. And a, fact, a focus on black trans women and trans women of color as inhabiting a category of most remaindered or most vulnerable has now moved beyond that, though, into the larger political context of progressive queer and social justice organizing, and I would say the left in general. But rather than bringing along a centering of trans women of color leadership, those representations aimed at progressive or liberal audiences often talk up vulnerability. Often we get white nonprofit experts or lawyers uh, being called on to give a political diagnosis of the situation, while trans women of color, and I would say actually trans women in general, are asked to testify or tell their stories, highlighting injury and redacting any mention of political agency. And this is not the only narrative, but it's one with a lot of traction, I think, in left liberal circles outside of trans communities. 
Vulnerability here becomes a method to extract value in the form of spectatorial sympathy. This extraction of value serves to conceal the reality, which is um, that the liberal state is not for trans people, right? It's not like they don't care. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and just as we're getting this moment of like trans recognition, um, people who are trans are also being targeted. Um, for example, by under Obama, there are a whole lot of um, immigration policies that criminalized, um, that, that focused on deporting people with convictions, right? And often that, that would be sex work or any kind of conviction, and that's poor people, people of color, people who are being targeted by, by the cops. Um, and that is trans people, often. What goes unmentioned um, in a lot of these conversations, though, is sex work, both within trans activism and within the larger left uh, context. Um, both the reality that sex work is an attractive way of making money for trans women, especially black, black trans women and immigrants who are often refused other kinds of work, and that law enforcement at all levels profile trans women by charging with them with sex work offenses. Within this discourse, trans women have found vulnerability to violence and displacement, make them candidates for increased protection on the one hand, often in the form of a homo-nationalist desire to save people from the putative barbarism um, of their own cultural backgrounds. And on the other hand, uh, trans women of color are hypersexualized and held responsible for that hypersexualization as bad subjects who must be rescued from their own deviant behaviors. So whether it's expressed in the form of vulnerability as a kind of biopolitical category, as a critique um, of that, or um, um, in the kind of instrumentalization of vulnerability as something that kind of corrals trans people, um, this focus on vulnerability and social death generally underthinks any relationship between trans women um, and transness and labor. So sex work and care work are barely mentioned in the context I'm talking about. Yet, in the representational logic of vulnerability, mentioning sex work and care, care work tends to consign uh, trans women and femmes to even more vulnerability, as it understands them as engaged in risky occupations from which they need rescue or redemption. So what, then, can we make of the spaces and times of people who are marked as disposable or as surplus population if it's something other than an analysis of social death, vulnerability, or exclusion from citizenship that exoticizes trans people and sex workers and directs us towards inclusion either within the wage or the nationalist framework of citizenship. I'd argue that we need to think more thoroughly about what the space of life and labor looks like outside waged work to begin with, at a minimum. So in an essay on wageless life, Michael Denning points out that talk of surplus or disposable populations can lead us to imagine that there are really disposable people, quote, not simply that they are disposable in the eyes of state and market. And additionally, he points out that bare life, or what people are calling bare life, is not without practical activity. If, as Chris Chen has argued, racial disparities as markers of economic subordination are, quote, grounded in both a permanently superfluous population and entrenched racialized wage differentials, unquote. The result is a racialized surplus population who inhabit what, like Denning, he calls wageless life. But I'm interested in what happens inside wageless life, and more importantly, what are the political technologies and forms that happen there? Nefertiti Tadiar offers some insights on the politics and creativity of wageless life when she theorizes surplus labor as remaindered life, or what she calls disposable lifetimes, whose futures function as liquid reserves or assets that states risk in gambling for investment or offer as collateral for debt. These lifetimes have value only in aggregate form, bundled as population itself. And Tadia argues that the temporalities of disposable lifetimes um, do not reflect the accelerated futurism of capitalist temporal logics, but rather the restlessness uh, of perpetual motion. And like Tadiar, I'm interested in mobilities um, and kind of forms of, of movement and temporality that are imperceptible to the optic of racialized capitalism of the state, mobilities that generate their own forms of self-valorization or politics. So I'm just going to skip a paragraph because I think I'm going to run out of time. 
Um, so what, what I've come up with to like think about this is the term minor mobilities. Um, and I'm drawing here on um, the term minor transnationalisms, which, um, which talks about mobility and migration that is not understood as like major or, or formal. What I'm calling minor mobilities here are those rhythms of movement that precisely look like restless perpetual motion, making do, but are full of energy and direction even so. And seeing these forms of movement as minor mobilities enables us to dispense with the liberal axiom that geographical mobility in consists in individual autonomy or choice. And there's a whole section in th that I'm skipping here which um, talks about mobility in particular, migration, but um, if you want to know more about what I think about that, or, um, I guess just go read my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's out now. Um, but in terms of thinking about um, minor mobilities, I'm also inspired by Kara Keeling's theorization of a queer of co color temporality that disrupts conventional narrative forms by asking not about political questions of where, spatially fixing the black or trans of color subject in space, but asking when. Minor mobilities involve a disruption or different r relation to temporality, specifically in the case that I want to talk about today, linear narrative cinematic time. And this is where I get back into Tangerine. And also, uh, that's like the end of the like dense theory. Uh, so yeah, take a breath. <laughs> Um, so in a key scene in Tangerine, and this is the least frenetic moment in an extremely frenetic uh, movie, a kind of suspension or oceanic beat, Alexandra runs into her friend Razmik, who's a middle-aged Armenian cab driver. Um, both are coming from failed attempts to exchange services for money. Alexandra's previous client couldn't get hard and refused to pay, and then when um, Alexandra takes his car keys um, and like to force him to pay, um, pay her, um, he attacks her. Meanwhile, Razmik has his own problems. I'm not gonna get into that here. Um, but additionally, he's just picked up a, a trick, Selena, in an area that's usually strolled by trans women. And on parking and asking her to get out her meat, he discovers that she's actually a cis woman, um, not um, the trans woman he had anticipated. And when he discovers this, he's like, get out of here and also like, don't work this area, like you're in the wrong place. Um, um, he's like, that's the wrong track for you, man. Don't work that track. So when Alexander runs into Razmik, they're both relieved to find someone who's offering what they're looking for. I'm so fucking happy to see you today, Alexandra says as she gets into the cab. Oh my God, you would not believe what I've been through. What a sight for sore eyes. And then they drive to a car wash um, and I'm gonna play you the clip right now. <coughs> just to contextualize how fast the rest of the movie is. Grab me! Hey, Alexandra, come here. I'm so fucking happy to see you today. Oh my God, you, you would not believe what I've been through. What happened? Get in. What a sight for sore eyes. I'm tired of being fucking nice to people. I got some money for you, don't worry about it. I think this is becoming our favorite spot.
Okay, so it's really odd, and when I started thinking about this film, I found it really odd that maybe the, the most accurate depiction of trans sex work that I've ever seen is this weird, I guess, independent mainstream movie that was made by a white cis guy, right? Um, outside of, of representations that are made by trans people themselves. Um, and the thing that I'm actually interested in is thinking about this as a political film rather than just a film about sociality. I think that politics is happening in here, um, and I'm going to argue about, I'm going to present my argument about what that, what that is. Even within, with and within disposability, people still organize. Politics happens in the spaces designated outside of personhood. Labor movements happen in the spaces designated outside of work. And these are only invisible to those who do not have the optic to notice. When we think about agendas for trans politics, we ignore at our peril the long history of sex workers organizing transnationally to fight criminalization, police harassment, stigmatization, and for better working conditions and access to health care. And often those politics might look like something formal, but they also look like somebody fighting back after, you know, like, uh, like there's a whole lot of ways that politics can look, and I think that they also look like sociality sometimes. That is, sex worker politics are integral to trans and queer politics. Claims for trans recognition that rely on claims to respectability and normality will only sell out the population who most need a world without trans violence. This means that trans politics and feminist politics both need to be more capacious. Trans politics especially needs to do more than fight against uh, medicalization or indeed um, against bathroom bills, for example, that's been a big issue in the US recently, in a way that specifically asks for trans-friendly bathrooms without acknowledging the myriad of uses bathrooms have put to, including the socialities of sex work, drug use, sales, and hanging out. This was made clear at a panel I was on at the American Studies Association conference in 2016. Um, and on the panel with me was Emma Koyama, who um, is a longtime trans intersex and sex work activist and disability activist, and who wrote the Trans Feminist Manifesto. And um, Emmy spent like very little time talking about bathroom bills. Instead, she talked about the systematic criminalization and profiling um, of trans women that forms a constant, ongoing, largely unchallenged background noise in relation to both the celebrations of the trans tipping point and outcry about bathroom bills, violence and criminalization on the street, in prisons, immigration detention centers, and halfway houses, and drug rehab clinics. She talked about how sex workers, or those who are profiled as sex workers, and trans people engaged in informal economies are subject not only to police criminalization and violence, but widespread betrayal by feminists in the anti-trafficking industry working with law enforcement to rescue sex workers. So this is, um, so I would say that we need to rethink trans politics, right? Trans politics is about um, Foster Sesta, for example, uh, which came into effect in 20, uh, 2017 is effectively removing any sexual, sexually explicit material or um, reference to the sale of sex from the internet and the enormous amounts of federal funding devoted to anti-trafficking collaborations between social services and police. Um, and I want to name check Kamala Harris here as one of the architects of a lot of that um, stuff in the US. Um, but this is like a Canadian audience, so none of you will get to vote for Kamala Harris. Thank you. Good. Um, <laughs> So our definitions of the political also need to shift. In Tangerine, Razvik and Alexander's encounter takes place in a car, the universal global symbol of economic and geographical mobility, but the car itself is not moving. The car wash gives an effect of constant movement without its materialization. No one is going anywhere else in this movie. They are moving in place. On a continuum with the street, the car wash is a place that is grasped temporarily and that affords the same restless, perpetual motion as walking. Sex, work, intimacy, revenge, restitution, romance, none of these things are cordoned off from each other. 
However, for Alexander and Cindy, the street is also a scene of contingent empowerment through transactional affect and bodily force, something we could call grit if grit were not so prescriptive of a work ethic. Alexander fights the guy who tries to rip her off, strategically taking his car keys so he can't go anywhere. Cindy's ferocious search for Dinah also works as a revenge fantasy on heteronormative gender and sexuality in Toto. Chester's chief sin is that he cheated on her with fish, um, a cis woman. This is politics in Chanderine and maybe in the world, and we dismiss it at our peril. I don't, however, want to romanticize Tangerine as somehow outside the circuits of value um, that make, um, that produce transgender violence and vulnerability. And the film's production and circulation actually functioned as a kind of form of rehabilitation from sex work for its actors. So Mia Taylor and uh, Kiki Rodriguez, who play Alexander and Cindy, were originally approached by Sean Baker, the director in West Hollywood, where they were doing street work to act in the film, and they've since become professional actors and minor trans celebrities. But I wanna um, ask how sustainable that, thank you, that a uh, minor celebrity is. Who can work it without a long, who can work it into a long-term income, right? It's also a fact that many of the uplift scripts for trans femmes who get out of sex work depend on creative labor and performance, and a simultaneous political labor being spokespersons or doing talks all of which is also contingent, low-paid, and immaterial labor. These are maybe more symbolically val formed, valued forms of wageless life, but they're unsustainable in the long term. And my wish for these folks, which includes like a lot of my close friends and collaborators, is not for them to get real jobs or to somehow, um, I don't know, be included in the labor market, because a lot of them actually don't want to be, um, and they shouldn't have to but for them to be able to live their lives and get and give care without needing to be workers at all, which requires the end of capitalism, right? <laughs> but as a starting point, this involves refusing the hierarchies of value in which unremunerated activism or representation are considered better than sex work. The potential of this politics depends on turning vulnerability from something that has a political value that's deployed as a biopolitical element of a marked population into something shared and redistributed collectively, a communization of vulnerability that doesn't occasion rescue or enfolding into liberal inclusion. And in real terms, this becomes the politics of collective care, not just vulnerability. This politics of care also needs to inform the ways people in the academy engage politics personally. And one form that politics of care takes um, is about my presentation today, like I put on makeup and that's not something I usually do which attempts something beyond the role of a kind of white trans mass commentator, um, not only because I love wearing makeup, but as a form of solidarity. And in my research, it's meant forming an ethics, acknowledging that I've actually spent years writing theory while hanging out socially with sex workers um, in queer and trans social worlds, um, sometimes being involved in sex work activism without bringing it to school or getting that this is actually the intellectual project that I'm engaged in. Um, with those folks as my intellectual community. So the product of this intellectual project, like giving academic talks, is a form of value making, both symbolic and material. And aside from the intellectual communities I'm finding here and this talk giving space, ethically this value making to me should also sustain the process whereby I funnel resources out of the academy through getting funding for various things, research. Um, and into that other intellectual project. This is not, as some cynical queer studies folks might claim, a form of romanticizing the undercommons, trying to be outside the university. It's quotidian and sometimes boring, almost never romantic, and that's the hustle. Thank you. one. Um, thank you for this opportunity to discuss my work with you today. I also want to thank, of course, Dana for um, bringing us all together and Valley, who has printed so many things for me over the past few days because I'm incapable after several years away from Toronto of finding places to print things, um, which proved a major problem for me the other day. So I have been wandering the streets 
Um, anyway, recently I was the object of an attack by the British tabloid media. In the UK currently, in case you aren't aware, the tabloid media have launched an unprecedented attack against trans people. Um, every single day, the newspapers are full of negative, degrading, and often entirely fabricated stories about trans people, painting us as predators, perverts, and um, wreckers of society. The headline... <laughs> The headline in the Sunday Times read, quote, Trans charity gives 500,000 pounds to former trans stripper to influence public opinion. It went on to call me a former cabaret artist as well. This story was wrong in several ways, <laughs> not least of which being that I'm still waiting for my 500,000 pound check. Um, and also that I've never been a stripper. Frankly, I lack the athleticism. World's laziest hooker at best. Um, but my first outrage thought was, former cabaret artist? <laughs> I hadn't realized that my performance career had been foreclosed upon. <laughs> This is funny now, but actually this is really traumatic and horrible to go through. <laughs> um, and it wasn't just the Sunday Times, it was also run in the Daily Mail, in um, the Express, basically every British media outlet um, ran pictures of me, including in the Daily Mail article, a picture of me and an ex-boyfriend of mine from many years ago at the Feminist Porn Awards. <laughs> I think they were trying to do this gotcha moment with me because they showed a picture of me when I had like short hair and they're like, oh, it's like a before picture. But like, joke's on you kids, I transitioned years before that one. Um, <laughs> anyway. As an intense multi-hyphenate who refuses to be pinned down to any one medium or genre, and perhaps after and with apologies to Trish Sala, um, I might say that what I do is trans-genre, um, it's somewhat difficult for me to summarize what I do in a way that is legible to people outside of it. I am both a writer and a performer, a historian and a high school dropout, a podcaster and a sex work activist. In all of these spheres, I find myself chafing at the boundaries. What cannot be expressed one way must be expressed another. And I guess that is how my body of work has come about. I also, I used to live here in Toronto for like seven years, and I feel like this is my first time back here in a few years. Uh, I've since moved to the UK, obviously, and it's brought up a lot of sort of um, retrospective feelings for me. So earlier today, I was wandering the streets, just kind of letting this wash of memories of like, angry breakups on street corners and um, walking past, you know that building in the middle of Spadina for some reason and being like, I had sex in there once. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, with a terrible person. Um, <laughs> and so I, I feel like I'm treating this like a minor retrospective. But anyway, I am hoping to touch on a few different projects that I feel like will assemble a vague impression of what it is that I do. The first of which, you see behind me, is called Say It To My Face. So my early performance work was concerned with the transsexual body and society. In particular, I was interested in the ways that I could push my body to extremes through audience interaction. My very first performance at um, Radical Queer Semen in Montreal um, involved, among other things, inviting cis audience members to come on stage and interact with my vagina um, however they wanted for 30 seconds on an egg timer, making real the everyday acts of violation and voyeurism that cis people carry out on trans bodies. 
Another performance done in a dominatrix's dungeon on um, Queen Street West for Nuit Blanche here in Toronto allowed anyone from the street to come in and interact with my body however they wanted while I reclined on a medical exam table and told them uncomfortable stories about my experiences surviving sexual violence. I also had this really intense, weird blonde wig on at the time. I don't know. I was going for like... I'm not even sure what I was going for. It was a whole moment. Um, these works were meant to be in dialogue with 70s and 80s feminist artists like um, Marina Abramovich, Annie Sprinkle, and the recently departed Carolee Schneeman. But more so, these works were built upon a foundation laid by trans performance artists, like some of the people that Trish spoke about at the beginning, including um, Miracele Ross, Ayanna Markle, and Nina Arsenault. In fact, I would never have considered working uh, in performance and video and as an activist if I hadn't discovered the work of Mira Sele Ross. Um, when I first moved to the city, I, as I said earlier, I was a high school dropout and I had nothing behind me and like my parents were dead basically and just like I like, arrived with a lot of baggage and um, I didn't, this is, you know, so many years before the tipping point, I didn't see that there were a lot of options for me existing in the world beyond um, sex work and like being a makeup artist. And it was discovering the work of Miracle Ross that really allowed me to think, to um, dream my way into a life that was worth living. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, but the most important, now I'm coming up to the thing. Uh, the most important performance in this early period was my hour-long endurance performance, Say It to My Face. Like many trans women, I have been subject to relentless attacks online by trans exclusionary radical feminists. This performance was a response to these acts of intimidation. In the performance, I stand naked at the front of a room, while hateful online comments ranging from vicious descriptions of my voice to full-on calls for the extermination of trans human beings from the face of the earth are projected onto my body. A microphone is in front of me, but turned towards the audience. When the audience comes into the room, they're given a set of instructions. One, approach the microphone where you'll be given a piece of paper. Two, read what is on the paper into the microphone. Three, Look it in the eyes. It deserves this. Um, throughout the piece, I do not move or speak or react. I only hold their gaze. Hate is an incredibly intimate experience. Eventually, the audience realizes that they do not have to participate in this act of violation and instead begin improvising their own positive messages or even in one instance, hugging my prone body. Pushing back against the complicity of violence, we are all invited into on a daily basis. Two, twat fest. Um, but where does performance art belong? When I was beginning my work, it was hard to find spaces that could accommodate it. Despite what the Sunday Times said, I didn't belong in cabarets because I rarely meant to amuse. Um, and Toronto's queer art scene at the time was notoriously anti-trans women. The late, great Haudenosaunee trans performance artist Ayanna Markle once wrote that every stage she ever performed on, she had to build herself, sometimes literally building the stage, because there was no context for an indigenous trans lesbian performance artist in the 1990s. Taking inspiration from this and from Miroslav Ross's seminal Counting Past Two Transsexual, Transgender, and Intersex Arts Festival, I tried my hand at creating my own festival, Trans Women's Arts Toronto Festival, or Twat Fest for short. Um, this is the, uh, the flyer, I guess. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I brought together about a dozen trans women artists from across Canada and the United States working in painting, poetry, video, photography, and performance for a one-day event at Buddy's with an after party at the Hen House. It was an interesting experience and sadly one that I didn't get a chance to repeat because it cost a lot of money to put it on, it turned out. Um, three. 
Space dates. Collaboration has become an increasingly important feature of my work over time, which has been a huge surprise to me because I'm a major loner. I don't particularly enjoy hanging out with people. <laughs> I'm really uh, hard to pin down for anything. Um, but collaboration is what drove what's perhaps my most well-known project, Space Dates, which initially started as a poster created by myself, Jessica Whitbread, and Anya Hogan Finley for AIDS Action Now's poster virus campaign. Have you all seen the poster virus stuff? It was like all over the city for a while. OK, you've seen poster virus. It's good. Anyway, mine is two women in spacesuits scissoring. And there's like a plate of oysters beside them for some reason. <laughs> on a retro feminist landscape. Um, <laughs> Jessica and I both, God forbid I use the term, are artivists, <laughs> um, <laughs> focused on HIV. And we are also notorious daters. Um, one day, we were discussing the similarities between her experiences dating as an HIV-positive cis woman and my experiences dating as an HIV-negative trans woman, and we struck on how disclosure worked almost identically in terms of stigma, potential for violence, and um, the idea of contamination. Jessica was like, I don't need a spacesuit to fuck you. <laughs> and I felt much the same. We decided to make a work together using this image to stand in for issues of disclosure and stigma. Titled Space Dates, the project continued for four years working across several mediums, posters, performance, photography, in collaboration with um, Toronto-based artist Tanya Anderson, and video in collaboration with Montreal-based artist Johnny Forever. The image remained the same throughout. Two women having cute dates throughout cities while dressed in spacesuits, uh, as you can see here. Um, some of them are really playful, like we're pushing each other on swings in the park and like Trinity Bell Woods. Um, some of them, like uh, one that happens right after this, we are uh, simulating oral sex with each other, but like in spacesuits in an alley <laughs> just off Queen Street West. Um, this work ended up being performed and presented uh, in a number of group and solo exhibits around the world and eventually ended up in the Brooklyn Museum for their Agitprop exhibit in 2016, uh, which is in here, not to brag. <laughs> um, four, you make me sick. My solo work continued to push on my own body to extremes in order to interrogate transsexuality and culture. One piece I'm particularly proud of was You Make Me Sick, which was performed at the Squirts Festival at La Mama Experimental Theater in New York in 2015. Actually, Alok was there that night and also performing. Um, in You Make Me Sick, I respond to the very common film trope of straight men throwing up upon discovering that women they are attracted to are trans. A video showing clips of this from every single film and TV show I could find it in plays behind me, including The Crying Game, which originated the trope, um, Ace Ventura Pet Detective, which took it to like a whole new level. It's like 10 minutes long of vomit. It's really horrible. Um, the Hangover 2, Family Guy, and on and on and on and on. While this plays, I'm dressed, vaguely, as Dill from The Crying Game, uh, extremely vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> and I silently eat a bowl of red jello. When I finish the jello, I then force myself to throw up. The whole time, you could hear people whispering, is she really going to do that? <laughs> One man, who I later found out was a notoriously transphobic writer, stormed out in disgust. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I love this performance, but my throat does not. So I have never tried to repeat it. Although, every now and then I'm like, mm, maybe I should do that again. Because I feel like I didn't throw up enough. I feel like I only threw up like a little bit. My gag reflex is really strong, but it just wasn't like working out for me. Anyway, it's a real problem. 
Um, as I said before, though I am embarrassed by the term artivist, it is perhaps the best way of describing my work. This piece, The State Has No Place in the Parks of the Nation, was a response to the Marie Curtis Park Sting in 2016 here in Mississauga. Um, the work obviously is a play on Pierre Trudeau's famous aphorism from 1967 where he was like, the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation, when he like decriminalized partially homosexuality, but only between two people and behind closed doors, and only if you're over a certain age. Anyway. Um, like many queer people, particularly those of us who have cruised, I was and continue to be horrified by the ways the state criminalizes queer sex by police and cruising. It's maddening now to think of this sting in relation to the fact that the very same police knew that there was an active serial killer here targeting primarily men of color in this city, but did nothing about it while simultaneously attempting to repress gay sex in parks. I will not mince words here. This is a genocidal agenda. Moving right along. In 2014, following the death of my boyfriend, I fled Toronto for Montreal, um, the city of depression, in my opinion. <laughs> My work slowed as an artist, and I focused more on writing. Um, during this period, I dated a couple of spectacularly awful New Yorkers in a row, um, one of whom cheated on me and left me for a cis woman. Um, the scandal. <laughs> in a depressed rage, I decided to get my revenge by starting my podcast, One from the Vaults. <laughs> The first and only podcast to bring you all of the dirt, gossip, and glamour from trans history. Okay, that wasn't the whole reason. <laughs> the other major reason was that I used to run a trans youth group here in Toronto, and um, with the group, I met so many young people who uh, were just amazing and brilliant in so many ways, but uh, they would often express that they felt like they had no one to look up to. This is like pre-tipping point. Um, like right at the beginning of the 2010s, and many of them didn't know of any trans person from before the 2010s, really, or uh, if you press them, maybe they could think of like one or two, but they often felt sort of adrift in um, history, in a way. And whenever I would share stories about our ancestors, I could see their eyes light up. I could see how immediately powerful and impactful it was for them to feel connected to a lineage of people going back in time, much the same way that discovering Mira Sally Ross for me um, was an extremely powerful experience. So with OFTV, I spent the past three years bringing trans history into an accessible audio format. I frame the show as gossip because often history sounds very dry <laughs> and like an academic topic. And I want my listeners, most of whom are not academics, um, to feel that these stories are live and relatable. I focus much of my research for the show on the most marginalized in our communities, sex workers, people of color, and other criminalized peoples. Um, and actually, I got a, an email yesterday that I'm really excited about where the San Francisco Public Library is going to take like downloaded copies of my show into the trans prisoner ward in San Francisco and play it for them because they don't have internet so they can't um, get it. So I'm very um, humbled that people would want to share that. Um, I also made the choice to only feature North American and European trans history from the past roughly 150 years. Basically, I feel like we, and I'm speaking in my white person we, um, have a problem with attempting to force different understandings of gender and cross-gender lives from other cultures into our own cultural framework. It's a bit culturally imperialist, so I choose to stick to the past 150 years in North America and Europe, though obviously even this has, it issue, has its own issues, particularly around indigenous cultures. Those caveats aside, OFT OFTV has been and continues to be a real labor of love for me. And you can go listen to it for free on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or SoundCloud. 
Um, I'm going to just finish, though, uh, with this final image, uh, which is my most recent work. It was created last month for Love Positive Women, the campaign founded by my collaborator, Jessica Whitbread, which is an annual valentine to women living with HIV around the world. My egregiously named artivism continues to focus on trans representations, the body, HIV, and history. I'm under the impression that I have run out of time. So thank you for letting me speak about my work. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hmm. <laughs> I am not great with technology, but I do have a slide, so. Um, so I, uh, and also thank you for your listening. Um, and many, many thanks for uh, assembling this group of folks to be in conversation with. Um, I feel like uh, my, my brain is already on fire, so I'm excited for what the Q&A can bring. Um, so since uh, the publication of uh, my second book, I've been humbled to be in conversations around the themes of black on both sides. Um, typically, I've organized my talk. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to speed through. There you go. Got it. All right. So, uh, you know, typically I've organized my talk around a chapter or two, framing some of the questions that animated uh, the writing. But what I prepared to do today is to talk about how history bears upon this particular moment, the politics of the leaked Department of Health and Human Services memo in the U.S., the return of the trans military ban, the various anti-trans bills circulating at the state level, such as the birth certificate bill in Utah, the recent government shutdown, the threats of national emergency. <laughs> wow. Okay, a deep freeze, in fact. Okay, great. Um, uh, to build uh, Trump's border wall, the ongoing crisis of human caging in prisons and detention centers, the myriad forms of anti-black violence that structure an American grammar in relation to some of the things that I've learned from writing the book. Uh, so some may remember uh, when on October 21st, 2018, the New York Times published an article under the headline, Transgender Could Be Defined Out of Existence, under Trump administration, a leaked memo from the Department of Health and Human Services argued that key government agencies in the U.S. needed to adopt an explicit and uniform definition of gender as determined, quote, on a biological basis that is clear, grounded in science, objective, and administrable. The agency's proposed definition would define sex as either male or female, unchangeable, and determined by the genitals that a person is born with. Any dispute that one sex would have, uh, any dispute about one sex would have to be clarified using genetic testing. According to the New York Times, the new definition would essentially eradicate federal recognition for the estimated 1.4 million Americans who have opted to recognize themselves surgically or otherwise as a gender other than the one they were born into. And this is quoting from the New York Times. So within hours of the article's release, the hashtag won't be erased began to circulate on social media. Uh, by the following Monday, activists and their supporters protested and marched in Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, and other cities uh, across the U.S. So to be clear, uh, trans people existed before state recognition. Uh, trans people live by avoiding state recognition. Trans people's survival has often been in spite of and often in opposition to the state. This is the story of many black trans people living now and in the past, like the figures I discussed in chapter four, who often emerged in the archive as a result of their violent encounters with the state. Take, for example, the story of Jim McHarris, Annie Lee Grant, who while apparently ridiculed for living life restively, also made a life as a gender nonconforming transmasculine person in Mississippi in the 1950s. In November of 1954, Ebony printed a five page feature resplendent with images of McCarris Grant under the headline, The Man Who Lived uh, as the Woman Who Lived as a Man for 15 Years. The Ebony feature began with an explication of the scene of McCarris Grant's capture, quote, into the small bare office of the, the mayor of Cuscayusco, Mississippi, or is Caseco. Mississippians have corrected me a few times. Sorry, Caseco, Mississippi. A policeman walked with a husky prisoner. According to the article, the police agent told mayor and city court judge, T.V. Roan, when I tried to search him, he protested and told me, quote, take it easy, I'm a woman. 
Within the confines of the mayor's office, which also served as the courtroom, McCarris Grant went into a closet, emerged some minutes later, having discarded a shirt, pants, and male underwear. Convicted, it is unclear from the articles whether the charge was traffic or gender related, and sentenced to 30 days in jail or a fine of $100, McCarris Grant left the courthouse with the intention of serving the time. And with editorial panache, Ebony represented for his audiences how the domain of gender is, as Eric Stanley describes, one of the most volatile points of contact between state violence and a body. The interplay of race and gender here in which a racially motivated form of police surveillance gave way to a gender-related court conviction produced a tripartite formulation as jail time was but one of McCarris Grant's modes of disciplining. Following Roan's decision, quote, word of the sensational unmasking of Jim McCarris quickly got around Kaseko and according to the article, jarred, and, uh, jarred the quiet small town. In addition to producing McCarris Grant's gender as spectacle, McCarris Grant was sent to the men's prison facility in which McCarris Grant was treated as a woman. Sarah Haley's analysis of carceral gendering is instructive here, which as she argues, quote, reveals that gendered knowledge is produced not merely through male-female binaries, but through a complex of material and discursive knowledge practice projects in which normative female gendering was produced through the spectacular cultural and legal production of the black female invert. In this sense, one should understand how Mississippi's penal system was particularly equipped to, quote, make sense of McCarris Grant's gender according to a neither nor logic, which is to say that McCarris Grant's legal assessment and carceral treatment was part of a long hi longer history of gendered racial terror, knowledge, and discipline. The story of how Annie Lee Grant would become known as James McCarris, particularly because McCarris Grant was raised only 78 miles away in the town of Meridian, Mississippi, loomed as one of the major questions for the article to address. As a form of visual proof, Ebony included an image of McCarris Grant at the top of the second page of the feature in a moment of partial undress uh, in included in the third triptych. Um, as, the textual as textual evidence, the article explained that before taking residence in Kaseko, McCarris Grant lived and worked in Memphis, Chicago, and other Midwestern cities where, quote, she threw herself wholeheartedly into the male masquerade, seeking the hardest jobs, including as a cook, a taxi driver, a gas station attendant, and a preacher. While McCarris Grant's movement from city to city is put forward as a context for McCarris Grant to practice and perfect life as a man, the movement itself is also explained as the outcome of McCarris Grant's talent for avoiding situations in uh, which would have revealed her true sex, in which McCarris Grant opted to quit jobs whenever medical examinations were scheduled. In an anecdote meant to dramatize the distance between the figure's adolescent presentation and McCarris Grant's appearance as an adult, Ebony opined, but Annie Lee was still restive. The article's use of the phrase, presumably to disparage McCarris Grant's gender comportment, opens onto a schema for understanding how McCarris Grant's various movements and uh, gendered ways of being were each negotiation points and what Spillers describes as a space for living. Rest, uh, uh, restive's double meaning, which in one sense describes the adverse behavior of the discontented, an inability to remain still, silent, or submissive, and in another characterizes a person who is stubbornly refusing to advance, intractable, refractory, fixed in an opinion or course of action, both refer, whether by fixedness or movement, to a person intent on resisting control. The term's double meaning also gives context for McCarris Grant's impermanent gender identifications, providing a more precise alternative to Passing's narration to suppose how a figure may inhabit various gender positions with a sense of sincerity and intransience until otherwise moved. As counterpolitical gestures, they form an alternative assemblage of evidence, not of teleological gender transformation, but of the possible positions one can occupy with incontradictory itinerant circuits of power. The feature's closing vignette stages the final exchange between McCarris Grant and the prison superintendent at the moment of McCarris Grant's release. Bidding her goodbye, Superintendent Eakin advised, quote, girl, get you a dress now and the things you, a, a woman ought to do. In response, McCarris Grant was quoted as simply saying, I don't see it like that. 
Ebony's story, bookended by a scenes of McCarris Grant's capture and release, ultimately concluded in the way it began. At 30, after a lifetime of heartbreaks and deception, Annie Lee made an incredible decision. She decided to remain a man, though exposed and publicized as a woman, determined to hold on to the strands of a way of life which made her happy. In other words, McCarris Grant remained restive. And I'm really interested in maybe thinking about restivity in relation to minor mobilities um, in, in particular. Um, I don't see it like that then reflects an insistence on a future worth living or what Kai Gree and Trevor Ellison call tranifesting, which is not only a collective action, but a worldview, a way of seeing despite the ways we are being seen. Though trans people existed before state recognition, this latest slate of anti-trans, anti-black, and anti-brown US federal and state policies intensify the relationships between transness and premature death for the most vulnerable in prisons, hospitals, detention centers, schools, and homeless shelters. As part of its ongoing coverage of the leaked memo, The Daily Podcast, a subsidiary of the New York Times reported on the migrant caravan, including a brief story about three queer and trans Salvadorians walking among the many headed to the US southern border. They were seeking asylum, and this is where Black on Both Sides began, with a news report about another asylum seeker. In 2015, while garnering publicity for the feature film Grandma and a live interview with Robin Roberts on Good Morning America, actress, artivist, and advocate La Laverne Cox expressed a public grief. We in the transgender community right now are reeling. Just yesterday, we found out another trans woman was murdered, Tamara Dominguez, and that makes a total 17 known transgender women who have been murdered in 2015 alone. It really is a state of emergency. Your life should not be in danger simply for being who you are. We have to say these people's names. I think the reason why trans women experience so much violence has to do with employment, housing, health care, et cetera. It, so we need to make sure that trans lives matter. Tamara Dominguez died on M M Monday, August 17th, 2015 in the Missouri hospital after sustaining injuries from being struck repeatedly with a sports util utility vehicle and a church parking lot in Northeast Kansas City. According to her boyfriend, she had been living as a woman in the United States for at least seven years after leaving her native Mexico to escape discrimination for being trans. She had a lot of dreams, the unidentified boyfriend told the Kansas City Star, invoking a familiar mythology of the hopes, dreams, and promises of different experi experiential modes of freedom possible in the United States. The framing of her death in such terms underscores the failed promise of the nation state as it also calls attention to what Enoch Page and Matt Richardson describe as a state technique of racialized gender that produces gender variant social formations as an excluded caste. According to an article published on advocate.com under the headline, Victim Number 17, Trans Woman of Color Murdered in Missouri, information regarding Dominguez's death came on the heels of news about three African-American trans women, Amber Monroe of Detroit, Candice Capri of Phoenix, Alicia Walker of Smithfield, reported murdered just in the past few days. The recurrent practice of enumerating the dead in mass and social media seems to conform to the logics of accumulation that structure racial capitalism, in which the quantified abstraction of black and trans deaths reveals the calculated value of black and trans lives through states' grammars of deficit and debt. As Catherine McKittrick explains about the, uh, about the long durée of slavery, quote, this is where we begin, this is where historic blackness comes from, the list, the breathless numbers, the absolutely economic, the mathematics of unliving. This mode of accounting, of expressing the arithmetic violence of black and trans death, as, as it also refers to anti-black, anti-queer, and anti-trans forms of slow and imminent death, find additional elaboration in what Dagmawi Wuchet refers to as a poetics of compounding loss, which he defines as a mode of inventory taking, the reconceptualization of relentless serial loss, not as cumulative, but as compounding, with the subject's loss, both object and subject, past and perspective, memory and immediate threat. From this vantage point, consider how Cox's designation of a state of emergency to, referring to, to refer to the killings of trans women, most of whom were black and brown, sharpens the distinction between the state's rhetorical use of the phrase and the real state of emergency that surfaces as a matter of history. As Walter Benjamin writes in the Eighth Tenet on the thesis of philosophy of history, quote, the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception but the rule. 
Benjamin continues, we must attain a conception of history that is in keeping with this insight. Then we shall clearly realize that it is our task to bring about a real state of emergency, which we might read along with Homi Baba, when, uh, who is written in the foreword to Fanon's Black Skin White Mass, that the state of emergency is also always a state of emergence, in which the event of struggle challenges the historicist idea of time as a progressive ordered whole. As such, Cox's gesture toward the numerous structural factors and institutional practices of racialized gender that delimit black and brown trans women's life chances expresses territories of violence, silence, sites of vulnerability and precarity, and scenes of slow death to which one might read into the et cetera, the prison systems, asylums, and detention centers. These institutions and their, and their emplacement within a current biopolitical and necropolitical orders bears upon the problem of history as a mode of organizing time according to anti-black and anti-trans rule. However, I also want to move to uh, the, the kind of uh, counter, uh, kind of counter political gestures that are happening simultaneously. Um, and in that way, I would also say that there is no necessary distinction between the beginning and ending of black on both sides, just as there is no necessary distinction between black lives mattering and trans lives mattering within our current rubrics of racialized gender. So, um, you know, in response to the current moment in which trans people, undocumented black, brown, and indigenous folks still insist on their lives mattering, the iconic black trans activist, Miss Major, whose image and quote has in the recent moment become a meme, I'm still fucking here, in relation to news of the leaked memo, moved to, uh, from San Francisco to Little Rock, Arkansas, because she said on the hills of this most recent presidential election, while they're blessing and inaugurating Trump, I'm gonna be inaugurating my girls. In another moment in this interview, she explains why the move to Arkansas. Because the girls in the South are suffering more than the girls on the coast. New York is fighting real hard, and they're together. San Francisco's together. LA is working on it. San Diego is pulling up the ranks. Uh, both the girls, and but the girls in the South, they are just struggling so bad. And behind this, I figure I should go there and use what notoriety I have with this documentary, referring to Miss Major, the documentary, to get something going there for them so they can realize that they are just as worthwhile as everybody else and they don't have to leave their home uh, and where they're comfortable and move to some big city because a lot of people aren't city folks. A lot of folks aren't city folks. And we can't imagine that cities provide full protection. In terms of suffering, though, Ms. Major might be referring to the horizon of premature death that shapes trans life in small towns and cities in the South across the and across the U.S. And even so, there is still life, a term I use to describe the interface of survival as that form of life that exceeds life's meanings and posthumous life wherein black and trans life continues to accrue meaning even after the event of death. And so I'll end with a supposition. Suppose that black lives matter, trans lives matter, black trans lives matter are not present tense or present tense formulations. Rather, as rhetorical enactments, they evince a different conception of history and therefore necessarily a different rubric for valuation. Recalling how, as Edward Gleason explained, history is destined to be pleasure or distress on its own terms. Glissant's emphasis on history's own terms elicits an engagement with the sociogenic principle as a concept through which to explore the temporal registers of BLM, TLM, BTLM. In the future imperfect, which is to say in that commingling of temporalities wherein the past is brought forth to the future to give rise to the present, black trans lives matter provides a conceptual framework for understanding the ongoing struggle in the present by way of a future aspiration in which black trans and black trans lives, black trans and black trans lives will have mattered to everyone. For some, including and following Fanon, that future effectively means the end of the world. And perhaps black and trans lives mattering in that way would end the world, but worlds end all the time. Sun Ra and his intergalactic research orchestra already told us it's after the end of the world. And even so, and as yet, there is still life. Thank you. Alok is in Tell Me a Joke Alok. And I first want to say thanks so much for having me here. So often people like me are research objects and never allowed to speak for our own experiences, so I appreciate it. I'm going to begin with some poems. You're more than welcome to make noise. When the 17th person takes a photo of me without my consent today, 
I began to wonder if I have a body anymore. I, a recognition that at some point, so many hands and eyes consume me that there is simply nothing left for myself. This is what happens when the private parts become public domain. And I say the instead of my because I looked in between my legs and saw a chat form happening there. I tried to chime in but got blocked. Have? How naive it would be to believe I could own something that others hold on to so dearly. The other day my doctor asked me to breathe and I tried, but I forgot how. There was no frame of reference. All the images I remember of myself involved me doing everything but breathing. There is no animated GIF for that. A. There are hundreds of photos of me circulating in text threads and web forums across the world. Look at the souvenir I found in New York. Look at this thing today I saw at the mall. Hashtag me. Hashtag same. Hashtag my BF. Hashtag tear emoji. Hashtag WTF. Hashtag goals. What I have learned is that it is only socially permissible to identify with me online. There's a type of loneliness that comes from everyone staring at you but no one seeing you. Every time someone takes a photo of me, I want to give them a hug to remind them that I am real. But the moment a meme becomes a person, the screen cracks and there is violence, body. I've come to the conclusion then that the only place I'm allowed to exist is a photograph. Exhibit A, a costume for a play. Exhibit B, how inspirational, read, I would never. A transgressive model breaking down gender norms. Exhibit C, an art installation. Exhibit D, a social media selfie that inspires you to only like the photo, not stop the violence. Exhibit E, share this, LMAO. A monk, he wears a dress and call himself a woman. Exhibit me, exhibit me to prohibit me. What would it look like to leave the house and not be afraid of being bashed? What would it mean to leave the house and not be bashed? What would it mean to leave the house and not be harassed? What would it mean to leave the house and not be objectified? What would it mean to leave the house and not be gendered? What would it mean to no longer be forced to do the work of gender? What would it mean to own my own body? What would it mean to have a self beyond my body? What would it mean to log online and not be told to die? What would it mean to have people say I'm here instead of you're fabulous? What would it mean to no longer have to be fabulous to survive? I said, what would it mean to no longer have to be fabulous to survive? What would it mean to be able to go home wearing what I want? What would it mean to be desired wearing what I want? What would it mean to be desired for me and not my body? What would it mean to be desired for me and not my body? What would it mean to be desired for me and not my body? Is it that I don't remember anymore? Or is it that I never knew? Is it that I don't remember anymore? Or is it that I never knew? I'm going to set a timer because I speak a lot, so I'm going to self-edit myself. I think Foucault would have a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Alok, and my creative vision is to end the international crisis of loneliness. I think a lot about how in 2019 I experienced more violence than I would have experienced maybe 50 years ago. And this is because so many people run to categories as if they're communities that people ran to gay because it did something, and maybe to trans because it does something. But what about those of us who none of the words stick to? In 2019, I am harassed and beaten, spat on and violated, not just because I am trans, but because I am gender non-conforming. I experienced this violence from within my own community of trans and gender non-conforming people who are hell-bent in thinking that a binary that was superimposed on us by white colonizers will fix everything. It doesn't, spoiler alert. <laughs> and so what I find myself experiencing most of the time is the condition of being the only, which is already always a condition of loneliness. To be called inspirational and innovative is another form of loneliness. To be called perfect is another form of loneliness. I'm not interested in being perfect because that would mean I wouldn't need you. And so I spend most of my time being stared at and when you get stared at a lot, when you're a monster or a freak or all of the above, you begin to wonder what are people seeing when they see me? And you begin to wonder that what they're seeing is they're seeing themselves in you. They're seeing the parts of themselves that they had to destroy in order to survive. They're seeing their loneliness, their oppression, their pain, their trauma shows when they laugh at you. They're re reverberating all the, the laughter that has been done to them. So as an artist, I think I spent a lot of my time trying to 
find a way to survive. I'm not interested in pretending that my ideas are somehow tangential to my survival. Fantasy has, and been, has been the only way that people like me can survive. What happens when the pain is chronic? What happens when the violence is relentless? What happens when you'll never pass? What happens when you don't have the safety or the privilege of being a woman or a man? You have to find a way to live life in a different grammar. And so what fantasy has looked like for me is I, I spend my time learning to love the people who abuse me. And I think that's my art practice. And I feel a lot less lonely for it. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you all this evening, I wanted to share about a residency that I did last month that I wish you could have all been at, but whatever, <laughs> time, space. <laughs> it was called Strangers Are Potential Friends, and that's kind of become my earnest manifesto. I'm really interested in earnesty. I'm kind of over this like trans mass cynicism. I'll call it what it is. Um, I'm kind of over this like queer killjoy moment because some of us would die if we didn't have hope. And so I conjure hope in things like lipstick or impractical, practical, five-inch heels. I conjure hope in clashing prints and reminding the West that this is not clashing. It's just your utterly unambitious fashion. <laughs> I conjure hope and knowing that I found ways to redeploy all the technologies of dishonesty and make them ruthlessly honest. My residency was at a really great place, come and visit, it's cute, called the Invisible Dog Art Center in Brooklyn. And it was called Strangers Are Potential Friends. Every time I get harassed, I remind myself that strangers are potential friends. I remind myself that the people who are harassing me could be queer and probably are trans just like me. I remind myself that the queer community is full of paradoxes, one in which we say that we are infinitely complex and fluid and then straight cis people, <laughs> as if anyone can be one dimensional. What I've learned about being gender nonconforming is everyone is gender nonconforming, it's just that some of us are honest about it. What I've learned about being queer is that everyone is queer, it's just that some of us are honest about it. I'm interested in what keeps people dishonest. And what keeps people dishonest is the idea that you get power from legitimacy, that you get power from credibility, that you get power from coherence but I'm not interested in being coherent. And what I wanted to do in this residency was to practice an alternative to coherence. Coherence is another form of containing. Why are we so invested in knowing? I mean, we know why. It's like the Cartesian dualism, the colonizer, like trying to theorize things, the brain, it's boring, we could go there. <laughs> but I think I really want to address this to the TGNC people in the room. Why do we care if cis people understand us? Why has the focus become terminology and language as if a colonial tongue can describe what I am? Why is the focus on being known as a category or condition and not being experienced? And I pay homage to Steven Universe for that one. <laughs> and what I wanted to do in this residency was to imagine what it would look like to take Ava Hayward, trans scholar's mandate to stop existing. Ava Hayward says, don't exist. What does it mean to not want to exist in a moment of disappearance? In a moment in which they're trying to obfuscate the fact that we've always existed, what does it mean to choose to not exist? I think what that means for me is, in my art practice, I'm actively resisting legibility because they want our narratives to be consumed, but what part of us is left for ourselves when we're finished being digested? I'm not interested in being consumed. I want to make people cough me up. I want to be thorny and gnarly. I've always just wanted to say the word gnarly. <laughs> so it's changes our potential friends. What I did is a series of site-specific performance pieces recruiting strangers, my potential friends, to experiment on what it would look like to fall in love with everyone. My political dream is to make everyone recognize that we can and are capable of falling in love with everyone. That actually, the reduction of love to monogamy is not only tragic for everything, but also prevents all the forms of intimacy that we can create with one another. Here I am, a stranger. Here you are, a stranger. Here we are, potential friends. Let's practice something else. And so what I did in this residency is I recruited strangers, and we talked about the things that I can't even talk to my friends about. Death, dying, loneliness, heartbreak. So the first performance I did was called Hi, Winky. And <laughs> what I did is I invited people to come and join me in the gallery all day and to just text about whatever. We just couldn't speak. I'm kind of bored of this moment of like the internet is tearing us apart, like alienation. That's just 
not true. Actually, I feel like selfies have allowed me to reach a lot of people. Um, the internet can be a conduit for intimacy. It's just how we use it. And what I wanted to do was to use technology rather than to drag one another, but to build each other up. So we came together and we just ended up texting about everything. And it was so awesome because we would want to laugh and be like, can we text lol? Like, is that what we should be doing? Or we would want to cry and then we would send a cry emoji and, and it worked. And we, we got what the cry emoji was really trying to do. And I just want to say shout out to the emotional labor of emojis. Like, <laughs> that's a lot. I th spent a lot of time thinking about the reparations I owe to the eggplant emoji in particular. <laughs> but there I was, just crying with strangers, and I wanted to share one experience. Someone looked at me and said, you don't know how to breathe. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you're breathing as if you're under attack. And I said, I am. And I realized in that moment that there are no frameworks to describe post-traumatic stress disorder when it doesn't stop. They add the word complex to it, but every time people come up to me, some part of my body recoils. I'm so used to being attacked, I'm so used to being surveilled, and I'm so used to being violated that I find it impossible to trust people. And in that moment, when that stranger taught me how to breathe, I recognized that that performance piece was about learning how to trust strangers again. I find it difficult to exist in public. I find it difficult to be anywhere but a stage. On a stage, there are power relations. <laughs> I know how to interact. In public, people touch me. In public, I'm afraid for my life. And so performance has become the only space that I can actually make life, where I can sit there and learn what it looks like to trust. Walking into a classroom is a form of trust. Speaking in front of a microphone is a form of trust. My hope and my dreams is that we can counter the course of history and find a way to build intimacy despite the way the university is predicated on destroying it. The second performance I did was I wrote love letters to every stranger. So after they would leave the gallery, I gave myself 45 minutes, and I tried to write the thing that would have kept me alive. And I basically told them that if they were ever suicidal or ever lost or ever desperate, that they had someone in the world rooting for them. And I didn't even need to know anything about them to write love letters. I do a workshop called Feelings. I hope you can come sometime. And what we do is we look at each other in the eyes for five minutes, and then we perform love poems for each other on our knees and confess our undying affection for each other. I am a Cancer Leo Ryzen, if, if you're wondering. <laughs> and um, I just basically sat in the gallery just crying, writing love letters to these strangers. And like now we still like text sometimes, and we hang out. But what I really was trying to let people know is I don't need to know you to love you, by which I mean why are we so focused on knowing as if that's a form of intimacy and not a form of containment. Then I Skyped with random strangers across the world to talk about how to heal from heartbreak. So I ended up speaking to six people in six countries. This is a selfie I took when I was just crying, talking to someone, relatable concept. <laughs> and basically I just asked people, where do you go when your heart's broken, you know? And there's no like pokey center, like I wish, I wish there was. Maybe I should just call the residents pokey center. I'm like trans nurse joy. <laughs> and basically what we did is we, we just basically talked to each other we'd never met before and, and I asked them how, what they did when their heart was break, broken and, and I told them. And, and then what we kept on telling each other is I feel like I've known you forever. And, 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 and then that for me felt like what trans politics should be. It's a return. It's not something new. It's saying I think I've been this forever. And then it made me think that it's the stranger that's the fiction it's the border that's the illusion, that actually this was not how we were meant to live. And if we're gonna use technology, why not use it to connect? And what I learned from this, I mean, many tangible things about like positive psychology and like neurons and stuff. <laughs> it was like, someone really taught me like neuron, like I was like, whoa, science, like, it was really cool. <laughs> but what I really learned is that actually, why is it that the things that we wanna talk most about, we can't speak about in public? And why is it that the university exists to talk about things, but we don't talk about the things that matter? Like, transgender studies is built off of objectifying people like me. Like, there are no gender nonconforming, trans feminine, racialized full faculty members that are given positions in this industry because we only matter in so much as we're research objects. Why is it that we talk about certain things and not other things? Why is it that we think of things as private and think of things as public? That was a performance called Hey. Then I did a cry in on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so basically on Valentine's Day, I invited 50 strangers to wear all black and we had a cry in. And 
Um, the wallet has a line from my poem that says, I keep falling in love with, with ideas of people instead of people themselves. And basically, we had an open mic in the center, and I invited people to talk about grief and loss and pain and despair and tragedy. And it was really actually, I think, my favorite thing I've ever done in my life, um, just being there on Valentine's Day, because a lot of people flake last minute. I'm guessing because they like believed in love or something. <laughs> or like, uh, and so then we just like empty seats, you know, and that was just part of the performance. Like here we are at the end of the world with a lot of people thinking that romantic love is gonna save them, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> instead, <laughs> we just kind of sat and we did something else. And, and what we began to actually do is in the beginning is really awkward, but I love awkwardness. And we were just like sitting there and, and then people just started going up on the microphone and, and just crying, you know, and then we cried. And then we felt better, and I started to really think about it, and I, I started to think about something I'm calling stranger intimacy. That actually sometimes I need validation from people I don't even know. That in fact it's the people that I don't know that often matter more to me than the people who I know. Because I wonder if the people if I know are just saying things to me to make me feel happy. But what we experienced in stranger intimacy is we just wanted someone to talk to. And I started to think about how the only place to talk or to be honest anymore is performance. How one of the paradoxes of the West is they say that performance is where we pretend to be something that we're not, but in fact, we're actually approximating the closest to what we are in it. That was a cry-in. I wish you were there. I'll do it maybe another time. This is someone crying at the cry-in. <laughs> and then I did a performance called Love Hurts, where I invited five of my best friends to curate a night with me of heartbreak, trans people of color talking about heartbreak. And the sort of framework I was doing here is friends are potential strangers. That even the people that we have in our lives are the people that we often don't ask them or inquire them. What does your anxiety look like? What does your digestion look like? What is your gum recession like? These are the questions I'm interested in asking about trans politics in 2019. What is your gum recession like? And what I did in this show is I spent the entire show on my phone, which I project behind me, and I use apps that turn me into memes to turn them into devices of honesty. So in this one, I put like my face on like uh, someone dancing around, you know, one of those things. And it says, what do you do when you're too ugly to be loved? And I texted that to God. And I asked God, what do you do when you're too ugly to be loved? And God was busy, so they didn't <laughs> respond, which was really sad. And what I do in the show is I use face mod modification software to become a white cis woman. And I speak to the audience as a white cis woman. And I say, would you believe me if I look like this? Would you love me if I look like this? Would you desire me if I look like this? Would I matter if I look like this? And what I'm trying to do in this moment is to say what happens when the entire system we have requires us to be in love in order to have care and comfort is that those of us who are disabled and those of us who are gender nonconforming and those of us who otherwise are unable to fall into love, which is such a strange metaphor, are left behind. And so this moment of trans visibility is a moment of being left behind. It's a moment of being visibly gender nonconforming and getting harassed every day. It's a moment of being harassed not just because I'm gender nonconforming, but because I'm not the right, right kind of trans. It's a moment of being stared at but never seen. And so in this moment of loneliness and heartbreak, I want to exist so badly. I want to say, this is who I am. My pronouns are. This is my identity. But in my art practice, I'm trying to agitate myself and the people around me to say, I should not have to exist to be real. I'll say that again. I should not have to exist in order to be real. That my pain flows beyond the boundaries of my body. That my gender spills outside of the follicles all, all around me. And so I want to, I guess, ask in this moment of trans visibility, who are we becoming visible for? And what standards of visibility must we emulate in order to be real? Why do we have to prove what we already were? I think that there's a kind of transcendence in the incongruity that I see as harmony. And what I'm trying to do with gender, with art, and with the world is to tear apart these kinds of dichotomies and binaries that were created, not just for oppression, but for loneliness. And I think we need to talk about loneliness. So I began saying, my artistic project is to challenge the international crisis of loneliness. And I think the way that we challenge loneliness is by admitting, is by admitting that when we say, look at me, when we say, see me, we're actually asking for something beyond the visual. We're demanding for something beyond the logical. What we're actually saying is recognize that we could talk for the rest of time and you would still not know who I am. 
but we could still love each other even despite love. Thank you. So that was magnificent. So many kinds of magnificence. Um, we have about 10 minutes. We can go over a little bit? Okay, so um, I've got a couple of comments and responses, and then I'd like to invite you all to chat, and then I'd like to invite all of us to chat together. Um, so um, first, um, s I can't begin to say how much there is to appreciate in these interventions, but in several of the talks, I get the sense that what we're struggling for is a mode of collective action, but that collective action feels somewhat impossible. That collective action feels fragmented, striated, and, you know, in Aaron's talk, for instance, uh, divided through normative types of gendered labor, um, normative expectations of racialized speech, and that those, those frames actually uh, produce a form of collectivity that is quite violent. Mm -hmm. So to get specific, thinking about Morgan's opening anecdote, how do we think through the need for trans collective modes of solidarity with sex workers, not only in the moment of trying to get some funds for an organization, which is obvious enough, important, but obvious enough, um, but in relationship to turf attacks prompted by speaking actively um, as sex workers, uh, in moments of community shunning uh, and collective violence within our communities, uh, moments of extreme exhaustion, economic and emotional burnout, like what forms of solidarity um, and collective life can we make that uh, take up these types of challenges to our uh, survival. Um, Riley, your paper moves from thinking about the leaked memo from health and human services to the ways in which the state construction of sex um, uh, uh, through racialization functions in Harris Grant's Rest of Life and, and asks us to think about gender-related violence as the result of racialized gender, one in which the emergence of transgender can be a site of emergency. Um, and so I wanted to think in your terms, can you say again how history may be mobilized in a minor key to manifest possible futures? Can you uh, take us into that? Mm -hmm. um, Alok, when you write about loneliness, when you're speaking to the projection of a cis and binary audience, uh, when you're speaking to racialized fantasy, what are the strategies fantasy allows you in terms of loving the people you've abused? And I, I think about... Uh, the um, facial um, modification software, but I'm curious about how you navigate the demands of disgust <laughs> and, 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 and love in those moments. Um, Morgan, I'm thinking about disgust, and I'm thinking about you vomiting, um, and it's social reproduction around trans women's bodies. So again, um, can you talk about the way you make me sick does work to transform how we are in relationship to um, our trans bodies, non-binary bodies, our racialized bodies, how, how mobilizing disgust um, maybe brings into relationship some kind of uh, collective relationship. And I, and I guess, again, Alok, I'm wondering uh, about that performance as a white cis woman in that register of um, you know, don't you feel disgusting? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, do you in those moments? Like, is there that kind of difficulty? So, um, if uh, each of you, as you're as you're ready, can make some comments. You want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Go first. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> um, I'll just project then, I guess. Um, if I, I don't really want to understand your question because okay. it would go antithetical to everything I was just saying about comprehension. Fair. So I'm just gonna like move from a disoriented, confused space and pull that. <laughs> okay. um, what's really cool about the software that I use is it's called Face Swap, and you can become people. 
people, and so I become Scarlett Johansson. Um, for the transhumanal audience, you might understand why. <laughs> and when I'm becoming Scarlett Johansson, it, the face modification software picks up and doesn't pick up depending on where my face is. So it blurs between me and Scarlett. Shout out to Scarlett. It's a group heat. And <laughs> my face kind of spills out. And what I'm really trying to get people to realize is so much of the rhetoric, and I think this relates to Morgan's presentation as well, so much of the rhetoric that is wielded on those of us who are trans feminine and gender nonconforming would never, ever be acceptable if it was wielded to a white cis woman. And that the ways that we've conceived of as feminism <coughs> is only white cis men against white cis women. And that any one of us who are outside of that kind of logic or algorithm, because feminism is an algorithm, and it renders everyone outside of that an anomaly or if a virus, if we want to be more honest with how we're treated. And then what I see happen in my audiences is a recognition that visuality actually affects a structure of believability. I think that many transgender people often know there's a moment at which when you become real in cis people's eyes that your violence becomes real. And until that moment, everything you are just doesn't exist. And so I've been sitting with that reality of I'm never going to have this moment because the metaphor, I have to relate my experiences always to women or to men. I have to relate my experiences to whiteness. My experiences cannot exist on their own. And so I think I play around that with technology. And then when it comes to loving, the love I grew up with was not white people's love. And what I mean by that is my parents never said that they loved me. Uh, but my parents cooked for me really damn good food, uh, which is increasingly hard to find in downtown Toronto, which is another point. <laughs> but the love I grew up with was that we were critical of each other because we recognized that not being critiqued is a form of loneliness. And we recognized that we had to grow together. And that criticism was not academic shade or internet trolling. It was something else. And so what I really have learned is that the reason I'm mad at so many people in this world is because they're not actually being just to themselves. This is not about me. This is about saying that it's ethical or OK to divide billions of people into one of two categories. That hurts you, not me. The way that the binary works is it makes you have to eliminate differences among the categories, as well as exaggerating the ones between them. That means you have to erase yourself in order to become real. And the thing about existence and definition is you have to erase yourself in order to fit into that category. And so I think what I'm trying to say is I'm hurt that you're doing that to yourself, and I'm hurt that you've been taught that the only way that you can be loved is to be known. And I want to offer you another way of living where you don't have to be known in order for me to love you. And I don't know if people are familiar with that kind of love because it's not a love that's enabling violence. I say a lot in my shows, um, the only ways we've been taught to love is to use one another and not to need each other. And I use the rhetoric of need, and what I often say in these shows too, and in this performance, is I need you, which I think is really actually much more interesting to me than this empowerment rhetoric that we've been wielded. Like, I'm strong, I'm res I say fuck resilience, <laughs> fuck strength, fuck empowerment. I wanna say I'm a messy cancer Leo rising who needs white people and cis people in order to get free, and I'm not ashamed of that. Going back to disgust, um, you mentioned like mobilizing disgust. I feel like in that work, you make me sick. Um, I feel like what I'm doing is obviously I'm trying to reverse the stakes here, you know, like. The reality is that transphobia makes me sick. The reality is that the way trans people are treated in society um, makes me sick. Cis people are making me sick. Um, and so I forced a room of mostly cis people to watch me get sick. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of, I guess a lot of my work deals with kind of disgust and disgusting bodies. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to say about that. You make me sick. <laughs> I, I feel like um, 
So there's the question of collective politics yeah. is just so hard, right? Because collective politics under an identity category is obviously violent because, you know, transgender as an identity category is colonial. It's it's English, it's, you know, it's like um it's so problematic and it and it, it kind of reproduces this logic that that visibility, you know, solves everything in the end, which I just really appreciate how we've all been talking against visibility in these beautiful ways, like really complimentary ways. But um, what it, what politics actually looks like when you give that up is a really open question. Um, one of the things I think about is um, Dean Spade did an uh, like an online interview last year where he was actually talking about stranger intimacy. Um, or like politics, or a kind of stranger politics, where you think about like when you're trying to figure out a political form or a strategy, think about it, how it's going to affect the people that you don't know, mm. that you have never considered before. And he's talking about that in the context of prison abolition work um, and a really long history of trans prison abolition work that you know Miss Major, for example, is one of the lead instigators of, um, where you know there's a whole network around the country of people who write letters to to trans and gender nonconforming and queer prisoners who they're never going to meet, maybe who they never who they've never met, um, because that's a form of love. Paying attention is a form of love. Connection is a form of love, and that politics to me is like, well, yeah, like if you think about your politics in relationship to the person that you haven't met or may not ever meet who is incarcerated in the jail that's nearest to you, what, how is this politics going to affect them? Then, yeah. And, and in all the kind of like dense ways that you need to be thinking about, like, uh, I don't know, like, but I don't even know if that's collective politics. Like, I don't know if that's collective politics. That's like it's just that's a yeah. I yeah. suppose in that instance, I was I was thinking about um, turf bashing. Yeah. Uh, uh, turfs bashing rather. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not to be confused. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was thinking. I was thinking about uh, you know running your festivals on your credit cards and on your sex work and then being broke. I was thinking yeah. about um, the kinds of labor that disappear, and I, I'm thinking about the fact that sex workers have been talking about the importance of sex worker solidarity for as long as there have been uh, sex worker organizing in in under that name, right? Mm -hmm. And longer, but so I'm I'm thinking about uh, political action that gets beyond thematizing itself in relationship to the real costs of um, uh, being visibly non-binary, for being visibly a sex worker, being out in public and engaging in ways that, uh, um, uh, which impact your life in exponential ways over time. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm asking, I, I guess, whether given you the, the way in which you thematize the gender division of labor within the staging of um, violence against trans women of color and expert knowledge in relationship to that. Mm -hmm. Like if we're doing something better than that, um, our aim isn't just a better visibility politics, mm -hmm. as you just said, it's actually, you know, what are, what are c tangible collective actions? And, right. and so I, I guess I was trying to think about that. Um, yeah. And I saw your paper thinking about that, so I, yeah. that's sort of what I was asking, if that makes any sense. Well, one of the ways is to like dismantle that division of labor, right? I mean, yeah, there's not, there's a huge division of labor within trans communities, which, which is totally gendered and which devalues affective work, emotional work, and which reifies like political work or like movement work or intellectual work and it's total bullshit and I can say that being someone who's like you know I make my living from doing intellectual work and like people come to see me talk and stuff but 
it's actually bullshit. What I'm really interested in is the emotional work and of connecting with with the community that I have outside of these intellectual spaces and which are also intellectual, which are, you know, emotional work is intellectual, right? Um, so that's, that's maybe one yeah. part. Yeah. Um, so, you know, part of what I was trying to think through in terms of uh, framing it as lessons is, is in some ways to, to, uh, think a little bit about what I was trying to do in the book, which was to say, can we do a history that's really suspicious of time, um, and particularly teleological time? And then if, if that's the case, then like what, what actual, like what kinds of models, whether because they've been repressed in archives or, alit or, or just are part of a kind of um, power processes that create elision like um, might already be future models for how to survive in a present that keeps getting um, narrated as uh, in, in getting uh, for the present that is that is often narrated as getting worse and worse and worse and like the kind of um, uh, conversations that are happening around Trump in particular as if like you know there isn't all kinds of cyclical time that mark how things have been worse for like um, black and trans folks in various <laughs> times. Um, and so, you know, in some ways it's like trying to play with the notion of presentism um, by perhaps jumping over the present <laughs> and trying to think about um, futures and, and pasts um, simultaneously. Um, but, you know, as I'm responding, I just wanna mark that like, I, my mind is really preoccupied by still thinking with a look around loneliness, and um, you know, there's something that I think is um, animating how I'm hearing also other people's responses in terms of um, the kind of various positions that we hold in in, in certain ways, and also um, the kind of uh, labor, some of which is is compensated as academics, m a lot of it is not compensated as academics in terms of the kinds of archives that we hold. So I'm just sitting with those feelings as well as we move to open up the conversation. Mm -hmm. So can we have questions and uh, comments from folks in the room? So I'm sort of thinking of restlessness as a sort of marker in the archive of queerness and trans mm -hmm. sort of non-belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just, I would just like to hear more about uh, moments of like intense migration, right? Because mm -hmm. this, this like Meridian, Memphis, Chicago mm -hmm. line, right? Mm -hmm. 19th, mm -hmm. Migration, right? Like, moments of mass migration in the present, sort of yeah. how we're dislodging this idea of this and restlessness mm -hmm. or privileging it, just if people want to talk further. Mm -hmm. How do you want to start? I don't know. I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, you should start. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there's, you know, there's this way of thinking. I, I, I'm trying to think about a way of thinking about mobility that doesn't like romanticize or valorize that restlessness, right? And that doesn't, I mean, I feel like there's been so much like, I don't know, boring mobility theory that's not even about queerness or transness, like, right? That's like, like, like the figure of the refugee is like the, the ultimate figure for like late capitalism or like, this is not where I'm taking this. Um, <laughs> I hope that's evident. Um, but I think that it's important to take seriously the question of whether migration or mobility is forced or voluntary and to take apart that notion of like forced migration, right? Where then like that doesn't, that doesn't, 
acknowledge the fact that people move for all sorts of reasons, not necessarily because they're forced to move. Like, maybe they're forced to move, but they have a, a whole lot of, like, they think a whole lot about where to move, how to move, like, where to go, right? Um, so there's got to be a way to kind of think about, and I just, um, I feel like I'm still taking this in. Like, I really liked what you were saying about restiveness and restivity and how that resonates with restlessness and, and also the, like, but thinking about that not as something where there's like a, a designated trajectory, like, like, where's the trajectory? It, it might be, it might not make sense unless you have the optic to like understand it. And what is that optic? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Uh, for, uh, I, wow. So initially I was gonna respond by saying like my next project's about going to the swamps. It's about a kind of particular locatedness that's like um, uh, continuing I think in, in tandem or like in, in resonance with what Aaron was just talking about like against the sentimentality of mobility, against the romance of like movement, which I think, you know, like yeah, we can dismantle that dichotomy of like forced or, or, or voluntary by maybe talking about movement under duress that's like, you know, like a kind of condition of pressure, which is what I'm kind of thinking about swamps as these kind of um, virtually uninhabitable zones that make other things possible. Um, and and maybe we'll call that something like queer trans. I'm not sure yet, you know, but, but I am thinking about it as um, sites of transformation that also kind of move, um, move, but um, psh, this is always what happens, <laughs> um, that uh, also um, unsettle the kind of categorical distinctions of uh, human animal object as well. So, yeah. Can I, can I sort of build on that question, because I think I want to bring the sick, mad, disabled body into the conversation, because I think living with chronic illness, I think a lot about like what it means, what restlessness means for me in my bed when I can't get out of it uh, because I'm in pain. Um, but Morgan, I feel like sickness is something you obviously very explicitly are engaging with. Um, and and I think that, you know, a look like you also are gesturing towards that when you talk about not being able to breathe and what it means to like hold your body with like ongoing pain and trauma. And so I'm, yeah, I'm just sort of wondering if that, if those kinds of bodies, like where where they are in these conversations that we're having, I think they're there. expressing that, and I think especially within an academic context, which sees p pain as a means to theorize and not sufficient unto itself, right? And I think to just announce pain and bear witness with it and not feel the need to pontificate over it, because mm -hmm. I think that's part of the ableist violence, that pain has to be legitimated. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of con continue this question or question or questioning around mobility and thinking about the notion of fugitivity that has been taken up very much within black studies, specifically black feminist theorizing uh, of uh, our current moment, and how we might think about that in relation to rethinking mobility, because we could rethink fugitivity as not just necessarily about movement, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. rather a shift in a certain kind of mental uh, mm -hmm. uh, psychological mm -hmm. stasis or even mm -hmm. just an intellectual stasis. Mm -hmm. There's like many ways in which we can mobilize that. Again, kind of thinking about this whole question around restlessness, right. uh, because I know from, I guess, a, a pedagogical perspective, my students are restless mm -hmm. and they want to see a certain kind of progression. They want by the end mm -hmm. of the duration of their time, the time that we spend together, 
that they have moved from somewhere. <laughs> and then by you know week 12, I have to basically say, no, we ain't going anywhere yet. We're still here. <laughs> right. We're still here, but right. we're just looking at the same place differently. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of thinking again around how we might play with this notion of yeah. futurity along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Because it really is about shifting where you understand how you're located. Right. I mean, you know, you're the um, theorist that immediately comes to mind is Harry Jacobs um, in terms of thinking about all the various ways that in incidents of a life of a slave girl she gives us loopholes of retreat some of which are physical some of which are mental some of which are uh, are housed in her in her body um, and is very much the thinker that I am, am uh, looking toward in the swamp project as well in terms of um, you know like the relationship between something like a loophole of retreat and the experience of something akin to freedom is like the kind of framework for thinking about um, or maybe rethinking mobility for me um, inside of a conversation about fugitivity. Also shout out to Wayward Lives um, because I think it also gives us a model for thinking about um, endurance or permanence, subs uh, subsistence as, as other forms of revolution. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, we, there's been kind of some nods to like optics, what kinds of optics do you bring to an archive, what kinds of optics do you bring to the kind of notion of mobility, which also obviously is indexing something about, is indexing um, conversations about ability, disability studies um, that are, uh, I, I think her, I think Wayward Lives is like an amazing way of also asking us not only to rethink what kind of uh, fugitive gestures are being made, but also what kinds of optics do we have in order to, to see them? Um, okay, I think we need to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much. Uh, another round of applause for... Uh, Yes, I want to thank um, all five of our guests for joining us. I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm filled with a sense of, of learning and excitement and, and love. So thank you so very much, and thank you to all of you.